good to be back this Sunday. We're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. So go ahead and open your Bibles. We're going to be in Acts chapter 13, looking at verses 36 through 43. Before we get into that text, though, I want to mention uh, two more things. I've gone back and forth on this first thing because uh, he wasn't able to be here this morning, and so I thought maybe I'd hold off, but then my mind goes to, well, then when we do announce it, is everyone going to say, well, why did you wait so long? And so I'm announcing it, okay? Um, because I want you to know it is joyful and too joyful to wait to say. But um, Alden and Faith, my son Alden and Faith were uh, engaged this week, and so uh, to be married. So. And then if I could just um, say quickly a thank you to Chris Rule and Kurt Sears. Um, thank you both for covering preaching the last two Sundays. I'm grateful that we have others uh, who bless the church with teaching that is helpful and faithful to what God's Word says. It's such a blessing. Thank you to Tim uh, for pulling out his guitar and leading uh, the singing this last week. I'm truly grateful for this church. When the Bible speaks about the church, it means people, not a building. A building might be where the church meets, but the people are the church, and I'm so grateful for those who make up this church. So as the church, let's go to today's text together. If you're able to stand, please do follow along as I read Acts chapter 13, beginning with verse 36. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for your word. What a gift this text is to us today, Lord. To be reminded again that our hope is in Jesus who lives. And Father, we pray for your help. We genuinely want to be a people who represent our King, Jesus. And so we need your help. We need your wisdom. We need your patience. We need your kindness. And we pray that you'd help us. Give us self-control and be glorified in this time, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, we're picking up where Kurt left off last week. Paul's making a defense for the gospel of Jesus, presenting uh, to this gathering of Jewish people and probably some Gentile converts to Judaism the truths about Jesus and how he is the true Messiah. The text is wonderful. It gives us again a, a clear picture of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus and how it is that we can be forgiven and set free by God. Verse 36, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. Now, remember that Paul has been using David as an example to help these Jewish people make the connection that there are things that had been said that were attributed to David but could not have been true about David. They were about another king that was yet to come. And as Kurt talked about last week, Paul references in verse 35 this proclamation that had been Made. It comes from Psalm 16, verse 10. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. And, and, and that was presumed to be about David. But how did that play out? Well, 
David died. And Paul says that after David had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep. That means he died and he stayed dead. He was buried and it says his body decayed. His body saw corruption. So we have two options. Either this psalm is wrong or it was about someone other than David. Now, I want us to consider before we get to who it actually was about what Paul says here. It says, David served the purpose of God in his own generation. Now, that is a a massive statement. You consider some things about David. When God chose David to be the man who would replace Saul as king, he chose him from his brothers who were bigger and stronger than he was. In the midst of the brothers being brought before Samuel, the Lord said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, do not look on his appearance, meaning his outward appearance, or on the height of his stature, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Not only that, but, but before he even identified who the next king would be, the Lord led Samuel to say to Saul, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his own people. Remember that Paul references this in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And when they had removed Saul, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Now that quote is from Psalm 89 verse 20, but it it includes the man after my own heart part from 1 Samuel 13 as well. And so up to this point in the story of David, we'd be like, yeah, Of course, he served the purpose of God in his own generation. Just look at his resume. But his resume doesn't start and end there. Let's be honest. This is is why we have to be cautious not to make the people in the Bible our heroes. I, I know I've said that many, many times through the years. But again, this is... This is why it's so important that we don't make the, the people in the Bible, and I know all throughout Sunday school we have these pictures of David with the, the slingshot, and he's got the rock, and boom, you know, Goliath is done, and you're like, yeah, that's who I want to follow, and Samson, and on and on and on. But those are not the heroes. They're only the heroes if we're not reading the text. And so, we want to be honest, David is is really, really difficult. It's hard to read the story of David with, he was a man after God's own heart in our heads. David had multiple wives, which yes, was common, but it was against what God had commanded. But that's not even close to the worst of David. David, having many wives, saw a woman bathing and took her. Now listen, I know this is hard, and I know some will push back on this, but but knowing the culture of the Bible, looking at the Bible culture, I don't see a way to read the story of David and Bathsheba and just call it adultery. This is sexual exploitation. This is a king assaulting one of his subjects because he wanted to. And because he could use his power to do that. And before you get upset, just a couple of things on that. There is not a single verse in all of the Bible, cover to cover, you can read. There's not a single verse in the Bible that says that Bathsheba sinned. 
Nowhere. And when Nathan confronts David, he refers to Bathsheba as what? A lamb. The picture of innocence in the Bible. And sadly, kings took whatever they wanted, and to push back on that would mean death. You think of King Ahasuerus in Esther. All of my life, I thought of, of that, that beginning of Esther as this, this royal beauty pageant. It wasn't. The king took those innocent young girls and slept with all of them to choose a queen that pleased him. You might say, but didn't they have fathers to speak up against the king? Those fathers had no say. And neither did the girls. And Bathsheba would not have had a say in the matter. This was the king. But if you're upset about that as you read the story of David, it doesn't end there. David then finds out that Bathsheba is pregnant, and so he has her husband, Uriah, who, by the way, has been at war fighting for David, put into a position where he will be killed. He murders Uriah. And, and then in, after that, you read the account of his children, and you find out David was a really lousy dad. Now, I include this in this sermon for one reason. Because Paul doesn't say here, and neither does the Bible, that David was perfect or that he was sinless. He did some really, really terrible things. But God's grace is perfect. It's God's grace that is perfect. And... and and because God's grace is perfect, it is true that David was able to fulfill God's purpose for him, even as a horrible sinner. And so before we move on to the best part of today's text, know that you can fulfill God's purpose for you. And God wants that. We should want that. God created you ultimately to worship Him. But also consider Kurt's sermon last week and the purpose of proclaiming the gospel to others. Seek that. No matter what your past is, there's hope in the gospel of Jesus. And let's seek to be people who desire and aim to proclaim the gospel. There's hope. Why? How is there hope? Well, Paul's saying here, David died. And his body did see corruption. So the psalm wasn't about him. And that's really, really good news. The gospel isn't about David. And that's really, really good news. So who was it about? Verse 37. But he... Whom God raised up did not see corruption. David did. He died and his body decayed in the grave. But the one that God raised up for this purpose, his body never saw corruption and never will see corruption. In other words, the scripture is true. There is one whose body did not decay. There is one whose body did not see corruption. He died but he was raised to life. And if he was raised up and his body didn't decay, then that means that he's alive now. Verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. This is incredible. And we, we, we don't want to miss the unbelievable life-altering truth that, that Paul is giving to these in the synagogue. First, Paul says, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers. 
Therefore, since it couldn't have been David because he did die and his body did see corruption. Let me show you, Paul saying, how God fulfilled this promise. Through this man. Which man? Jesus. God offers forgiveness of sins through Jesus, through Jesus who was and is sinless. Through Jesus who rose from the dead. Your greatest enemy is not Satan. Satan is a great enemy. We're told in the scriptures he roams around like a roaring lion seeking those who he can devour. But he's not your greatest enemy. Sin is your greatest enemy. And and Satan is the father of lies, but he doesn't make you sin. You and I choose sin. That's our greatest enemy. And if that enemy is not defeated somehow, then we will not be reconciled to God because sin is what separates us from God. It's what keeps us from God. But what Paul's saying here is, there's really, really great news. He's saying that through Jesus, we can have forgiveness of sins, that our enemy is defeated. God offers full forgiveness through Jesus, the one who was executed by Pilate with the help and blessing of the Jewish leaders of Jerusalem. He was crucified, but then He was raised from the dead just like he had promised beforehand. It's amazing. And then he continues in verse uh, 39. And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. I love this. Now what does this mean? It means if you believe. If you believe who Jesus is and what he did, then you will have full pardon. You should have been convicted. I should be convicted. But Paul reminds us here, if we trust in Jesus, if we trust in what Jesus did to fulfill God's law and His covenant were pardoned. Paul writes to the Colossians in Colossians 2, 13 through 15, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. The record of sin that stood against us with its legal demands has been canceled. Set aside by being nailed to the cross. There's no greater news than that. Jesus came to set us free, Paul's saying. And that freedom comes through faith to everyone who believes. He writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Jesus came as the ultimate and true sacrifice for sins, and He alone is able to save to the uttermost. He alone is able to cancel the record of debt we have because of sin. The law could never do that. But Jesus does that for all who believe in Him. Now, let me go back to David for a moment. That's the... That's the part that we rejoice in in the story of David is that he did confess his sin before God. He did repent and God 
forgave him. That's the beauty of the story of of David, which is a really, really hard story to read. To think that David, in the things that he did, to think that Saul, who was a terrorist, trusted in Jesus and was forgiven. a lot of hurt and pain in David's life, and yet God was gracious to him, the same grace that Paul says he's offering to any of us who believe in Jesus. Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. When God says that you're forgiven, it means that you're completely forgiven, that your sins are are washed away. But we don't want to take that for granted, right? And so Paul writes in Galatians 5.13, for you're called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You're freed to walk in newness of life. We, we, we cannot work our way into eternal life with God. We cannot. It is a free gift through faith in Jesus. It's grace. If you believe in, if you trust in Jesus, then you are free. Your debt is completely paid. And you and I then are blessed to be able to live in light of that freedom. And so things like the Sermon on the Mount come to life. We, we don't have to read that any longer with this burden of weight and looking at it thinking, I could never do that. No, we have Jesus now. We can walk in newness of life, even pursuing to love others, even our enemies. Because we know how much God has loved us even when we were his enemies. Paul's boasting in the grace of God here before those in the synagogue, the crucified and risen Son of God, the Messiah that they had been waiting for, he's saying, has come. And then he gives them this warning in verses 40 and 41. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish For I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. Don't ignore the work of God. That's what Paul's saying as he reflects on this text from Habakkuk. Jesus is moving and working. He's forgiving sins. He's changing lives. He's advancing his kingdom on earth. But Paul points to the prophet Habakkuk and reminds them of what Habakkuk had said. He had prophesied that some would not believe. And and Paul's saying if the people don't believe, even as God is doing such great things, great things meaning the Messiah coming and as a servant to bring forgiveness of sins to them through His death and resurrection, if they don't believe, then what the prophet said will happen to them. One commentator writes, the quotation from Habakkuk 1.5 underlines the urgency of Paul's message and it anticipates the rejection that follows. In the Hebrew context, Habakkuk formulates a warning to the Jewish people of his time that God will perform a work that they will find hard to believe. and He will cause the Babylonians to invade their country as an instrument of God's judgment. Now, what's the connection here to the gospel. What's Paul saying? This work that God has accomplished is resurrection. And through Jesus, God's kingdom is invading this world. And the only way to be a part of that kingdom is through faith in the one who was resurrected. And so Paul's saying, you either believe in Jesus, which is a hard thing to do, For some, just like Kurt explained so well last week, 
You either believe in Jesus that he died and that he was raised, or you miss out on this kingdom that is invading the world. The resurrection of Jesus is the main subject of the second half of Paul's address. Jesus is the risen and Jesus is risen and therefore new creation is possible. It has begun. God has finally fulfilled his promises through Christ. And then lastly verses 42 and 43 as they went out the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Now, this is hopeful. When Paul finishes saying these things, the people begged that they could hear more, tell us more. So wonderful. They're eager to hear more of the gospel, to hear the truths about Jesus. There's no greater news than that. No greater truth than the gospel of Jesus Christ, than the grace of God revealed through Jesus. And that's what Paul encourages them with. It says he urged them to continue in the grace of God. Not in their works, Not in what they might be able to do, but in God's grace. We must. We find hope in the grace that says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God. And we strive to walk in newness of life. We put off the old and put on the new things that come through our identity with Jesus. We boast not in ourselves, but in the grace that brought us salvation. And we know in our hearts that our only hope is Jesus. And so just as Paul encourages those leaving the synagogue, let us continue in his grace as we people of grace. Let's seek to live in light of the kingdom He brought to this earth through His teaching and through how He lived and and purchased for us through His life, death, and resurrection. We're going to go into a time where we take the Lord's Supper. In verse 34, just before our text today, Paul references Isaiah 55, verse 3, and it says, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Do you know what Isaiah says just before that? Now, this is the context of, of is, is for, for this is, is bigger than just chapter 55. This comes after the section in chapter 53 that we read often. This speaks of how the servant, the Messiah, will suffer and die. How he'll be crushed for our iniquities. How he'll heal us by his wounds. And then in chapter 54, he will be vindicated. But then chapter 55, right before this verse that Paul references. 55 begins with this. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come Buy and eat. In other words, come and partake because it's all for free now. We're blessed to take the symbols of that great promise as we take the bread and the cup together. The bread reminds us that His body was broken for us cup reminds us that his blood was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins so that we can come and partake for free. And we identify with him together as we take the bread and the cup. So you're going to be dismissed by Rose to come and receive the elements of communion and take them back to your seats. And then after we sing, we'll take them together. But as we sing, 
Let's lift our voices and our hearts to give thanks to the one who has come to forgive us, who's invited us to freely come to him for grace. The song that we're going to be singing begins with these words, I've seen my Father's glory revealed in Jesus Christ. That's exactly what Paul is trying to to help them and us to see here in Acts. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. You're so good to us, Lord, so gracious. We pray that you would help us, that we be people who who know the gospel, who love the gospel, who seek to live in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you would work it into our hearts so that it is what we speak about and and the purpose of our living. We pray for your help in these things, and even as we are blessed to have this time where we take the Lord's Supper together, help us, Father, I pray. We want to together proclaim the Lord's death as we anticipate you are coming again. So help us to do that with great joy in faith. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.